running, and then I walk out, whoo, just like that. Well, today is Pentecost Sunday. It's that one Sunday of the year that Lutherans talk about the Holy Spirit, right? Well, no, we're supposed to talk about the Holy Spirit all the time. And actually, we, along with many Christians around the world, we baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We believe in the triune God, the one that we talk about every week when we say the Apostles' Creed. That is our God, that we have unity with many, many Christians around the whole wide world. But today, yes, we're going to talk a little bit about the Holy Spirit. You might um, say, oh, she's just going to talk about things like speaking in tongues today. I know it, and it makes you a little uncomfortable. Or you might be like, yes, she's going to talk about speaking in tongues. I've been waiting for that <laughs> all year long. Or you'll be like, Holy Spirit? You know, we don't talk about that much. You know, we do. When I talk to the kids about who is God, the first answer is Jesus. They know all about Jesus. They can tell you the story. They know that Jesus loves them, that he's their friend, that he died on the cross for them. When I say, who is God the Father? We know that we pray to our Heavenly Father, that God the Father gives us all the good things we need. But when I ask about the Holy Spirit, crickets a little bit. We're not as comfortable talking about that. And it's harder to pin down, right, the Holy Spirit who is everywhere and does everything and can go around and we can't put the Holy Spirit in a box, right? Well, if we look to Scripture, though, we can maybe somewhat get a glimpse at what the Holy Spirit is up to. When we look at our Scriptures from today, um, maybe this helps a little bit. Uh, in our short, short explanation of the Holy Spirit is that the Holy Spirit proclaims the mighty deeds of God, right? It came from our scripture in Acts 2 today. The Holy Spirit proclaims the mighty deeds of God, and over and over again in scripture we see this. On the day of Pentecost, Pentecost was a holy day that they're all getting together to celebrate. Now, today though, Pentecost has come to mean the day where we remember what happened here. That the sound from heaven, like the roaring of a mighty windstorm, came and filled the house where all the believers were together. And what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. Everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit. And they began speaking in other languages, it says. They're amazed and they were perplexed. And they said, we hear all these people and they're speaking in our own languages about the wonderful deeds of God. And then they asked, what can this mean? <sighs> the Lutherans now sigh. Because they're like, I know that question. <laughs> I'm a Lutheran. I've been in uh, confirmation. And we loved asking that question. Martin Luther said, what does this mean? And so we're going to ask that ourselves. What does it mean when the Holy Spirit proclaims the mighty deeds of God in our lives? Well, first of all, it's personal. Oh boy, is it personal. The Holy Spirit, that is. The Holy Spirit comes to you personally. Jesus said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that the captives will be released, that the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free, and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. And Christ's kingdom has come even unto you personally. And that Holy Spirit is coming to you to proclaim these mighty deeds of God in Jesus Christ. That you have been set free from sin and death and the power of the devil. That you have been made an heir of the kingdom. That you someday will get to go to heaven in eternal life with your heavenly Father and Jesus Christ your Lord. This is personal. Jesus said, the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father is going to send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I've said to you, Jesus says. In your personal life, the Holy Spirit is going to call you to faith. 
is going to strengthen your faith, is going to encourage you, is going to sanctify you, keep you until the day of Jesus Christ, until you see him again face to face. That, nothing else is more personal or powerful than a personal relationship with Christ Jesus your Lord. And the Holy Spirit is there to help you with that. At Lutheran Church of the Master, we practice baptism. We love baptism. And we practice baptism for people of all ages. Jesus says in Matthew 28, Go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. That triune God is the one in whose name we baptize, just as Jesus said. And then Luke 18, there's a story of how Now, some of the disciples thought, well, maybe not all people should come to Jesus, especially maybe not the kids, right? And so the disciples, as Jesus is teaching and people are bringing their children to him, the disciples are trying to keep the kids away from the Messiah, from Jesus, the rabbi. And Jesus says to them, let the little children come to me. Do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Jesus says, truly, I tell you, anyone who does not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. Now, remember when Jesus taught us how to pray in that Lord's Prayer? How did he say we should pray? He said we should pray and call God Abba, Daddy, Father, the Holy Spirit calls us into such a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and with our God that it's like we are a child. We are a child of God, and he is our parent, and he loves you so much. So, I don't know at what age faith happens. I know Christ commands us to baptize, to bring up children in the faith, knowledge, love of the Lord. And I know Jesus calls the children even to him. But it is the Holy Spirit that is ultimately the one working that faith in each of our lives, no matter how old we are. And it's mighty, and it's powerful. In the letter to Titus, it was written, God, our Savior, saved us not because of righteous things that we have done, but because of God's mercy. He washed away our sins, giving us a new birth. Just like your first birth, you had no choice in that matter. Your second birth, your new life, is now through the Holy Spirit, it says. He generously poured out the Spirit upon us through Jesus Christ our Lord. Because of his grace, he declared us righteous and gave us confidence that we will inherit eternal life. So adults here today, you might feel sometimes like a little child, even in your faith. You might say, you know, I don't know if I deserve the Lord. I don't know if I understand and get my can get my mind wrapped around how big God is. Sometimes I really need God to be my parent, to be my daddy who says, I just love you. I'm not going to let you go. I'm going to give you all the things you need. I'm going to forgive you in the name of Jesus. Come to me, my child. Sometimes as adults, that's what we need is to just be a child of God again. Or... Maybe that Holy Spirit has come to you like a rushing windstorm. Maybe now as you've matured into Christ, maybe you feel that fire. You might feel the fire of the Holy Spirit in your life sending you out. And it's just so much. It is joy. It is hope. It is peace. It is a certain knowledge that you are beloved child of God an inheritor of eternal life, and you can't hold it back. You have to tell others of the mighty deeds of God. That is the Holy Spirit working in your life. It doesn't matter our age or where we're at in our faith relationship. It is personal. It's going to look a little different from person to person. Now, I heard a congregation here in town who's doing, I think, something cool. On Pentecost Sunday, they do adult baptisms and adult confirmations of faith, where the adults get to stand up and proclaim the mighty deeds of God in their lives. 
how God has personally come to them in Jesus Christ. That's awesome, I think. Now, we're not doing that today, but we do in our worship services talk about God sightings. How has God been a part of your life in a personal way? How has Christ come to you? How is the Holy Spirit working in your life? And we share that, whether at worship or in Bible studies or just one-on-one -on -one if you happen to be visiting with somebody in a pastoral sense, in a caring sense, and you tell them the mighty deeds of God. That is the Holy Spirit working in your personal life to share Jesus Christ with the whole world. Which brings us to worship together as the body of Christ. So yes, now let's talk a little bit about speaking in tongues. It's biblical. I've seen it happen. I have seen somebody uh, speaking in a language that I did not understand and another person interpreting that and speaking about the mighty deeds of God and the good news of Jesus Christ. It was awesome. I've, I've rarely seen this happen. It was amazing. It took me a little while till I realized, whoa, this is what they talked about in the Bible, in Acts. Now, you might not see that as often at our church or in some worship services, but you might. It has happened here before. You could see that. Yep, it's biblical. And when those things happen, when that Holy Spirit comes and people are speaking in tongues, they're not doing it just to show off. They're doing it to proclaim the mighty deeds of God, to praise his holy name. This is worship. In Acts chapter 10, this happened again. The Holy Spirit came again to the people of God. Peter preached about Jesus. Peter told them the story again about how Jesus died on the cross from them, how he rose from the dead. People came to faith, to belief at this point. But here now, there are people from lots of different backgrounds and traditions in this worship service. There are Jews who had grown up Jewish. There are Gentiles who did not grow up Jewish. And so they've got different traditions, um, different uh, starting places in their faith journeys. And here, the Jewish believers are astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even among the Gentiles. It says, they heard the Gentiles speaking in tongues and praising God in their worship service. And so Peter then said, surely no one can stand in the way of their being baptized with water too. They too have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. And so Peter ordered that even the Gentiles would be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit is tied in with our baptism in the triune God. The Holy Spirit is tied in with our proclaiming and telling the good news of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit is in our worship services, in our praises of God, in our uniting us as one church body in the name of Jesus Christ. Galatians chapter 5 actually reminds us of this unity that we have, that the church's one foundation, what brings us together is Jesus Christ our Lord, and only him. And the Holy Spirit then lives in us when we gather together in worship. Galatians 5 says, you are God's building. And it's not talking about these four walls that we're in right now. You are God's building. No one can lay any foundation other than the one we already have. Jesus Christ is our foundation gathered together today. Don't you realize that all of you together are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God lives in you? In Romans chapter 8, it tells us about praying. You know, sometimes we think that we go off and we pray all by ourselves in a closet, right, where nobody can hear us, but we gather together in worship and we pray together as well. And if you're ever with somebody and they ask for prayer and you don't know what to say, it's the Holy Spirit here in Romans 8. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. The Spirit intercede for, intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. The Holy Spirit is present in our worship. It looks a little different from time to time. It's not going to look the same from worship service to worship service, from person to person. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 2, God just tells us that, that there's different gifts of the Spirit 
1 Corinthians 2 says there's different kinds of spiritual gifts. The same spirits, the source of them all. God works in different ways. It's the same God who does the work in all of us. And so the Holy Spirit gives to some people wise advice, special knowledge, great faith, healing, miracles, prophecy, discernment, speaking in tongues, interpreting in tongues. It is the one and only Spirit who distributes all these gifts. He alone decides which gift each person to have, should have. You know, here even this morning, um, I'm sharing with you some words from Holy Scripture. I could not have shared with you my vocal talent. Others were sharing with you and praising the Lord this morning. And today, you might have something. And I know I'm getting ahead of myself, but oh boy, it's so exciting. That how is God calling you and your special spiritual gifts that he's given to you? The Holy Spirit looks different from person to person. So what unites us? Jesus Christ. In the New Testament, here were these Jews and here were these Gentiles, and they came from different traditions, and they did not always get along. Surprise! And the Jewish people thought the Gentiles should act a certain way, and the Gentiles said, we don't want to act the way that the Jews were acting. And so how were they going to be united? It was only by the power of the Holy Spirit, reminding them of their faith in the salvation of Jesus. Romans 15 says, with one mind and one voice, you may glorify the Father, God, in, of our Lord Jesus Christ. So accept one another then, just as Christ has accepted you, in order that you would praise God. This is worship. As it's written, I will sing praises of your name, and may the God of hope fill you with joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. This is getting a little emotional, Joy, peace, hope, overflowing with the Holy Spirit. Pastor Tyler likes to call this, when we talk about worship and the Holy Spirit, our heart language. That we all have different types of heart language. That the Holy Spirit works in our lives differently. We have contemporary worship here where we really want to encourage that emotional response that's biblical of the joy of maybe the relief that comes from hearing your sins are forgiven again. That you can experience the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. That's not to say traditional is not emotional, because traditional worship is very emotional. When you get that peace, that assurance of the love of God, that uh, steadfastness that Christ will be with you day after day and minute after minute. It's heart language. And so here these pastors, us, we've done just something crazy this last year. And for so long we've been kind of, you know, fighting everybody's different heart languages. And we've been kind of fighting the Holy Spirit, giving to us all different gifts, even in worship. And finally this year we kind of gave that up. And we said, okay, we're going to have concurrent worship services at 915. And so at the 915 service, we have a contemporary here, and we have a traditional happening down the hall. It kind of seems crazy. And maybe you think, oh, we're separated. But we're not when we're united in Jesus Christ. And it has been so cool to finally acknowledge that and just let the Holy Spirit go in all of our worship services, that heart language, that freedom. Because then following that service, if you came in here and you got to see all the members from the other services getting together, whether that was for Sunday school or just drinking coffee and eating donuts with one another and visiting with each other, and then throughout the week they do service projects, even if one person goes to traditional and one person goes to contemporary. They do service projects and Bible studies with each other because what unites us? The Holy Spirit in our faith of Jesus Christ our Lord. It is so cool. Now today, or tomorrow, you might get together with your family or your neighbors in your community and your family might also be Lutheran or they might be Catholic or they might be Methodist other Christians who also baptize in the name of the Father Son and the Holy Spirit but you're going to be gathering maybe on this Memorial Day weekend at a cemetery and you're going to be gathering for worship and for prayer and you'll be standing there at a cemetery 
at a grave site, proclaiming the mighty deeds of God. You'll be proclaiming the real promise of the resurrection of the dead in Jesus Christ. Tell me, the Holy Spirit will not be there in all these cemeteries across our country this weekend as people gather for Memorial Day. It doesn't matter what kind of our worship services look like. The Spirit comes to each of us a little bit differently, but unites us in our faith of Jesus Christ. Which brings me last to our public life. <laughs> because I tell you what, people are watching when we go to the cemeteries, when we have our funerals, when we talk about Jesus raising people from the dead. People kind of perk up and they listen and they wonder what are those crazy Christians doing. They, they get along. No, they don't get along. They're worshiping in other places. Now they're actually praying together. What is this? People are watching what you're doing in your public life. And the Holy Spirit is going to be a part of your public life, proclaiming the mighty deeds of God. So let's see what happens to Jesus, right? What had happened to Jesus in Luke chapter 4 when he got up in his hometown and the Holy Spirit was upon him and he proclaimed the good news to his family and his friends, his closest friends and family? They tried to throw him over a cliff. <laughs> Oof, that's hard public opinion right there, following the Holy Spirit. And if we look in about Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, here the people of God are getting together and they've heard about Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit is coming to them and they're speaking in other languages. They're proclaiming the mighty deeds of God and people on the outside are publicly watching them. And what do they think? They think these people are so crazy. They must have just been drinking too much. And they all got drunk. Now that's some judgment there, right? You might feel a little out of control when the Holy Spirit takes control of your life because people are going to be watching publicly how you live for Jesus, how the Holy Spirit is calling you into the world to tell others the good news. And their opinions will vary <laughs> about you, whether good or whether for bad. But that Holy Spirit expects some action. The Holy Spirit has some good things that he's going to produce in your life as you follow him. It's not about what people think of you. It's about what people think of Jesus Christ. And it's about what the Holy Spirit is going to do in your life. Producing results. Galatians 5 says the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. You might feel out of control, but in Christ and the Holy Spirit, your control, you now belong to him. And it's a good thing. It's, it's wonderful because you have hope. You have that joy that we read about earlier. You have the peace of knowing the sure and certain hope of salvation in Jesus. There's no law against these things of the gifts of the Holy Spirit and his fruit. Now, just a couple stories to end us up here. So you kind of have an idea. Maybe you can get your mind thinking of what does the Holy Spirit look like in your life publicly. When I was in college, I had a professor who was so cool, which is saying a lot because I was a computer science major. And we were not that cool. <laughs> and this professor was so cool that one day we opened up the paper and she had been arrested, like, to jail. <laughs> that was cool, we thought. So her and a priest in Lincoln and another five outstanding citizens, you might think, oh, arresting, that's not a good thing, but they were arrested for protesting the unfair people taking advantage of others Specifically out in White Clay, Nebraska, the businesses were selling alcohol and taking advantage of the residents of the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation. And so her and this priest and these other five people, they went out and they actually preached the good news to the poor. And they preached that the blind would see. And they preached that the oppressed would be set free 
and they got arrested for it. And I remember this. <laughs> you know, this had such an impact on me, wondering would I ever be able to do that? To stand up, to follow the Holy Spirit even at my own peril so that somebody else can receive the fruit of the Holy Spirit of kindness, goodness, gentleness. 1 Corinthians 2 said a spiritual gift is given to each of us so that we can help each other. So no, you might not be called to go out and protest like my teacher was, but you have some kind of spiritual gifts. It might be that, protesting, but it might be something else. Remember Dr. Rick Sacra? He came here to Nebraska. He had been serving as a medical missionary in Liberia at the time of the Ebola crisis. And he got the virus himself. And so here he comes to the University of Nebraska, um, here in Omaha, and, uh, and they're trying to save his life, and his life is saved. And so he has survived this deadly disease. And so you might think that he should be so grateful now, but what does he do? He goes back. <laughs> you think he maybe was judged a little bit for that, going back? to serve some more? Well, he went back then to teach others, to help others learn, and to, again, heal people. He'd been given the gift of healing by the Holy Spirit, and not for his own glory, but for the glory of God, that the mighty deeds of God would be proclaimed. And he took that seriously. He followed the Holy Spirit, no matter what other people thought of him. A spiritual gift is given to each of us so that we can help each other. And through his following of the Holy Spirit, the fruit of love, of joy, of peace, of hope, and salvation in Jesus Christ is given. So what about your life? Where is the Holy Spirit in your life? What gifts has this Holy Spirit given to you to produce good fruits in this world, to proclaim the mighty deeds of God? And that is your challenge that I'm challenging with you with, that the Holy Spirit, God, is challenging you with today. To look into your personal life and your relationship with Jesus. To look into your worship life, not only here at our church, but with the whole church on earth in the name of Jesus. And to look publicly. Where are you called to follow the Holy Spirit publicly to proclaim the mighty deeds of of God, no matter what might happen to you, so that the Holy Spirit can produce good fruits in the world. Lord God, Heavenly Father, 